about his search. I welcome you to our workers' training period tonight. And I pray the Lord will enlighten us and apply the word in every heart in Jesus' name. I'm waiting for a good, good amen. amen. Father, we thank you for our workers' training. Thank you for your people. We're asking that you will lead us into your word and let the word have effect in every life, every father, every mother, every child, and everyone in the family in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, that this word will not just glide by or slide by us and uh, just uh, not have any effect. It will have effect on every life, on every family, on every minister. It will have effect on the whole church in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. We're reading from Ephesians chapter 5. And I read from verse 21. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it as unto the Lord. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Verse 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Verse 29. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord, the church. And in verse 33, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence, respect her husband. In the passage of read, the Lord gives us God's expectation and God's stipulation and God's specification for the Christian family. The husband and the wife in their fellowship, in their relationship together. And the Lord expects that this part of the word of God, which had actually runs from the beginning of the Bible to the very end, should be taken to heart by every believer and by every minister and the minister's family itself must be according to the standard of the word of god otherwise how will the minister be able to teach effectively what god expects of every family and here we have seen the expectation of the lord we have seen the purpose we have seen the plan and we have seen the prescription he makes for every family it tells us in Titus chapter 2, reading from verses 4 and 5. Titus chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. It says that they may teach the young women to be sober. It's talking to elderly women in the church here, that is in this passage. That means they themselves must have good families, godly families. And because they have good families and godly families, they can now from experience, they can now from the teaching of the word of God, which they themselves have been, they can pass that across to younger wives. It says that they may teach the young women to be sober and to love their husbands and to love their children. And then in verse 5 it says, And to be district, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. We'll come back to Ephesians. We're reading from chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Children are part of the family. And it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right, honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and that and thou mayest live longer on the earth. 
Tonight, we are looking at the Word of God on the divine purpose and plan for the godly family. The divine purpose and plan for the godly family. There are three things we are considering. Number one, the seven pillars in a godly family. Pillars are very important in any building, in any house, in any household. Pillars are very important. If the pillars are destroyed, if the pillars are eaten off by termites, if the pillars crumble, then the house, the household cannot stand. And the Bible makes it very clear. The pillars we have in the house, in the household, in the family. Point number one, the seven pillars in a godly family. Number two, the supportive partner for greater fruitfulness. Before you get married, you're fruitful. If you're a child of God, you're fruitful in every area of your life. Spiritually, you're fruitful. And professionally, you are fruitful. In the work of your hands, you are fruitful. But then God wants you to have greater fulfillment and greater fruitfulness. Because of that, he gives you a husband, gives you a wife to support you and to help you to move faster and to climb higher. Point number two, the supportive partner for greater fruitfulness. Point number three, the specific preservatives for a, for a glorious future. There is a future for everyone. And the future God has for everyone is supposed to be glorious. It's supposed to be a happy future, a pleasant future, and a cheerful future. A future that you will say, that's my dream, that's my desire. Here there's a future on earth and there's a future there also in glory. And so whether we're thinking about the future here on earth or the future after the grave, after the rapture, there is a glorious future. And there are specific uh, preservatives, that is, uh, the things you do that will preserve that future that God has for everyone and for the family also the specific preservatives for a glorious future number one the seven pillars of a godly family i'm reading from proverbs chapter 9 proverbs chapter 9 and i read here from verse 1 proverbs chapter 9 verse 1 wisdom has built her house she has hewn out her seven pillars you look at the house, you look at the family, you look at the household, you look at that united entity, the husband, the wife, the children, the father, the mother, the children. And it says, if that house is going to stand, stand on solid ground and stand on shakeable and stand unmovable and in all the vicissitudes of life all the challenges of life that house that household is going to stand if that family is able to is going to break the storm the storm that may come on that family we must know about these seven pillars because these are the seven pillars that support the family that sustain the family, that keep the family unmovable, unshakable. And in that Proverbs chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Wisdom has builded a house. It takes the wisdom of God, not the wisdom of the world, to build the house, to make the house, and to develop the household. And it says, She has hewn her seven pillars number one the seven pillars in a godly family what are those pillars let's come back to ephesians chapter 5 ephesians chapter 5 we're looking at the seven pillars in a godly family understand that when you have seven pillars supporting the family or supporting the house if just one pillar is missing and one pillar is destroyed and one pillar is cut down and one pillar is eating up it's going to affect the stability and solidity of that house of that building of that edifice and then when three of the pillars are down 
when four of the pillars are down just two of the pillars will not be able to sustain there so you want to think about all the seven pillars that are revealed to us supporting the house making the house to stand the seven pillars in a godly family number one love number one love we're looking at ephesians chapter 5 verse 25 Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25 Husbands love your wives Even as Christ also loved the church That's a pillar That's a pillar in every family That's a pillar that sustains the family That sustains the house Husbands love your wives Even as Christ also loved the church But it's not a one-sided love Only the husband loving the wife and the wife not loving somebody said well those wives we don't need to teach them to love they love naturally that's not true that's not true titus chapter 2 titus chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 3 all through to verse uh, 5 it says the aged women likewise that they be in behavior as becomes holiness not false accusers, not giving to much wine, teachers of good things. That is, uh, the women leaders in the church and those who are matured and those who have been in this race before these uh, young women came into the race and those who have married, they've raised families, they've raised children and they've uh, helped and supported their husbands and they have manifested the quality of a Christian wife. Now they are aged, now they are elderly. Let them teach now the women. What are they to teach the younger wives? Look at verse 4, that they may teach teach the young women to be sober and to love their husbands and to love their children and we're not talking about you know, a mother just naturally loving the children a wife naturally loving the wife we're taught in the scripture that this is a scripture is the scripture we should look at and the kind of love we ought to have it's not just i love you i love you what are the components of that love and what does the scripture expect from the husband from the wife that they love each other and it says to be district in verse 5 and chaste that's part of uh, the love uh, demonstration to the husband keep us at home that's part of that love uh, she's not running away from home early in the morning and then very late at night uh, you know coming back and the husband and the wife they barely see they barely talk they, be, they barely relate there's no communication it says keep us at home good obedient to their own husbands that the words of god be not blasphemed one pillar love love the love of christ the love coming from the heart of christ to the believer by looking at ephesians chapter 4 verse 31 ephesians chapter 4 verse 31 let all bitterness and dross and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice that's uh, one side of love the absence of bitterness and the absence of malice and the absence of bullying on each other shouting on each other that is a clamor the uh, absence of malice there's no malice you wake up in the morning you love your wife you love your husband you love your children you love your parents there is love that is the absence of every negative attitude look at the positive side of that love as attitude and be kind one to another be thoughtful Think of kind things you can say, you ought to say, and the kind things you ought to do. Little, little things, little drops of water make a mighty ocean. And the little acts of love and the little acts of a kindness, it says, and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another. And that is, you are not uh, keeping the offense. Uh, you know, my wife did that, my husband did that, my children did that, my parents did that, and uh, the home 
is a battleground and it's a ground for retaliation. I remember what she did. She must say, suffer for that. I remember what he said about my mother, what he said about my father. Uh, he must suffer for that. I remember the way he has, uh, you know, uh, made himself to be like a stranger, a tyrant at home. I must pay him back. It says, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. That's one pillar. That pillar is love. And this is not uh, just something we learn about, we read about, we study about. It is something we will. That is, by the will, you say, I'm going to love her. By your will, I'm going to love him. It's by determination. It's by a decision. And we're going to pray that whatever will contradict that kind of pillar that will cut down that pillar in your family that know it will not stand, you'll be stronger than the termites. You'll be greater than the termites. You'll be greater than the things that come to the family, that happen in the family, that tries to break down the pillar of love. We're looking at Songs of Solomon, chapter 8. Songs of Solomon chapter 8, I'm looking at verse 6. Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm. And for love is strong as death, irresistible. Love is as strong as death. But jealousy, on the other hand, is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which, uh, as, uh, which has a most vehement flame. It's saying that the love you have to your wife, the love you have for your husband, is not something placid, it's not something dull, it's not something dormant, it's not just something quiet, it is fervent and it has a flame. And you know, if a fire is burning somewhere, somebody will know the fire is burning. You cannot say, you know, I love her, but you know, she may not be able to tell, and you cannot tell how much I love you. Uh, husband, uh, my husband, you don't show love to me. You know, it is not what I do, it is not what I say. It may appear that I don't have love for you, but you know, deep, deep in my heart, the it, it, it love is so deep, I cannot even express it. The love is so deep, if you can, you will never see it, but you know, take it by faith. I love you, you know. It is something that is like a flame, like fire, like, and it is fervent. Look at verse 7. Many waters cannot quench love. It's, we're talking of the love of Christ. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Uh, you know, persecution might come, uh, jesting might come, maybe between husband and wife, uh, at present now all you're expecting is not in the family yet and the parents of the man uh, they are saying what kind of a woman is this uh, we don't have this you don't have this you don't have that many waters of criticism cannot quench that love and many waters of you know i didn't know it will be like this i didn't know this will happen that will happen and all these uh, challenges and restrictions and you know a kind of poverty i didn't know this will happen many waters cannot quench love neither can the floods draw it if a man will give all the substance of his house for love it will utterly be contained what that is saying is that your love is a kind of superb and supreme other men may try to win your attention it looks like you know you made a mistake in that marriage and uh, you don't have this you don't have this you know if you switch over to me i can give you this i can provide this for you it says no all those things that people can practice uh, promise outside your marriage it will not affect your love you say no thank you very much my husband is my husband and is the greatest and the highest king in the whole of the universe for me apart from christ he is the next person and my wife is a queen for me and apart from christ she is the next one and so you are not exchanging what you have for any other thing number one, one number one pillar love i come to ephesians chapter 5 ephesians chapter 5 i'm reading from verse 25 ephesians chapter 5 verse 25 we're looking at the second pillar self 
sacrifice self-sacrifice we're looking at Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25 husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for each and gave himself for each a stingy man will not make a good family a stingy woman will not make a good family one of the pillars in the in the family is self forgetfulness self sacrifice that you give yourself you remember it says husbands love your wives as christ loved the church and what's the demonstration of that love self sacrifice actually i would have wanted to take that to myself but that should go to my wife i would have wanted to enjoy that for myself but that will go to my husband i'd like to take care of my family I'd like to take care of my, you know, extended family, cousin, um, other people, and brothers and sisters and siblings. But my husband is number one. I would like to take care of, you know, my siblings that, you know, we, we have grown up together. But my wife is number one. And your sacrifice, you're going to sacrifice to take care of that wife, to take care of that husband. He gave himself for it, for the church. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. And I'm reading from verse 7. Isaiah chapter 58. Reading from verse 7. It tells us in Isaiah chapter 58 verse 7. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? You are not going to allow your husband to be hungry. You're not going to allow your wife to be hungry. You're not going to allow your children to be hungry. And your parents, if already now you are a child and you are working, already your father, your mother, they have trained you and you have got some substance in this world. You're not going to eat everything you have by yourself because you're part of this family. And is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? Your father is hungry, you are not even looking his direction. Your mother is hungry, you are not looking at her direction. Your children are hungry, you are not looking at their direction. What, where is the love? Where is the pillar that sustains the house? It's need not to deal thy bread to the hungry and to bring the poor that are cast out to thy house. Uh, what happened that, uh, you know, your, one of your children, well, she is already beyond 18, is already beyond 21, and there's no job yet. I've sent him to school. He's graduated. If he doesn't get work, that's, uh, you know, his own, uh, his own business. No, he's poor and he's ragged and he has nothing and he's still part of the family. Out of university, he's still out of the family. Out of school, he's still out of the family that should take the poor that are cast out. When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him. Look at this, look at this. And that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Thine own flesh. Husband and wife shall be one flesh, that you do not hide yourself from your own flesh. They need material things to cover their nakedness, and they need, um, you know, some substance or whatever, so that they can feed, and they will not die of hunger, and you'll not be spending all your money alone by yourself. In fact, in honor preferring one another, she must be forced in your consideration. He must be forced in your consideration before you spend anything. You know, you're saying, this is all we have. We have this, we have this. I remember there's uh, money in, uh, you know, that other account. I've not looked at for some time now. And she must have knowledge about everything. Uh, and then we bring everything out and you spend on her. If it's a woman, you spend on him. Self-sacrifice number two. I'm coming to pillar number three now. We're coming back to Ephesians chapter five. Ephesians chapter five. Uh, we're looking at chapter 20 chapter 5 verse 26 this one is righteousness 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 is a pillar in the family look at ephesians chapter 5 verse 26 that ye might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word 
and that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish and you know he's talking about husbands love your wife even as christ also loved the church and he goes on to say husbands love your wives this is what christ did for the church you understand that the wife ought to be righteous the husband ought to be righteous in fact we are told in um, revelation chapter 19 verses 7 and 8 revelation chapter 19 Verses 7 and 8, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. That's talking about the church and it says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, is made herself ready and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the same. And there must be righteousness in the family. Uh, husband, you are righteous, yes, for yourself, so as to get to heaven. You are righteous so that your wife can have confidence in you. And your wife will say, no matter where my husband goes, and no matter where my husband, who my husband is interacting with, no matter what conference he goes, and I'm not there because the professional scene, I am sure my husband remains righteous. And because of that, the heart of the wife is a kind of a happy and rested. The same thing with the husband. He says, I know what, wherever my husband goes, and wherever my wife goes, rather, I know she's going to be righteous. Righteousness is a pillar in the, in the family. Look at Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. It says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but all mongers and adulterers, God will judge. We'll come back to Ephesians chapter 5, pillar number 4 comprehensive care. Comprehensive care. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 28 so ought men to love their wives as their own body my brother how do you feel when you're hungry how do, you, how do you feel when the weather is biting hard on your body how do you feel when you don't put on a good clothes how do you feel when you go out and other people look at the way you are dressed and they look down on you and you feel that you are not appropriately dressed well it says the husband should love the wife as the as his own body the way you feel is the way she would feel more so being a woman and therefore you make sure that you take care of her you feed her you nurse her you nourish her you cherish her you close her and you give her appropriate shelter it goes on to say he that loveth his wife loveth himself let there be comprehensive care for your children comprehensive care for your husband comprehensive care after all, what's the money doing in the bank while the family is having need? What's the money doing there while the family is suffering? Bring the money out. The reason we're working and the reason we're laboring is to take care of the wife, take care of the husband, take care of her parents, take care of her children. For no man yet ate in verse 29. No man yet ate his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as as the Lord the church even as the Lord cares for the church as the Lord nourishes the church as the Lord cherishes the church even so must we do look at first Thessalonians chapter 2 first Thessalonians chapter 2 I read from verse 7 it says but what gentle among you even as a nurse cherishes her children the mother is to be a nurse cherishing the children when we take uh, children to the hospital and the nurses take care of them that's an indication to us that's a lesson for us as that nurse is uh, talking to the child nursing the child taking care of the child to nurse the child back to health that's what the mother should 
like you the mother should be the number one person that should act like he knows and then the father too here is paul the apostle is a man there was a man and he's talking about nursing and cherishing the children look at verse 8 so being affectionately desirous of you affectionately desirous of you affectionately desire of you the presence of your husband does not annoy you and the presence of your wife does not annoy you the presence of your children should not annoy you you should be eager desirous to see them you shouldn't be outside and people are asking when are you going back home well there's nothing to go back home for i'll spend more time here at least i'll send a good jolly time here happy time here before i get home after all when you get home what are you going to meet it should not be like that when you go out it should be that this is of necessity that you have to leave your family you have to leave your wife you have to leave your husband you have to leave your children you have to leave your parents this is necessity only that i must go to school only that i must go to work only that i must attain to this outside and once you finish that you're so eager you're desirous that you want to go back home because of the love, because of the fellowship, and it's uh, you have comprehensive care. Look at that verse eight. So being uh, affectionately desirous of you, we well, were willing to have imparted unto you not only the gospel of God only. Well, well, it's very good. The family wakes up in the morning and we share the word of God and we have devotion, money devotion, and then we have the gospel being explained to each other, husband to wife, wife to husband, and parents to children and children to parents. That's good to share the gospel together, but also our own souls because you are dear unto us that's the attitude well to have that the husband loves the wife so much and the wife loves the husband so much that you are willing to share your very soul with that husband and with that wife and that's talking about uh, comprehensive care look at first timothy chapter 5 verse number chapter 5 reading from verse 4 but if any widow have children or nephews let them learn first to show piety at home and to re and to requite their parents that is to reward their parents bless their parents provide for their parents for that is good and acceptable before god what do you think that a parent has educated a child to university level and he has educated to a child to a place now he has profession he has work he has job and now that child is not looking the direction of the parents and the parents have to be you know depending upon the handouts that come from friends that come from neighbors or that come from the local church it should not be so there should be comprehensive care when you are young as a child and you couldn't provide for yourself your parents provided for you your parents educated you your parents gave you a life to live and your parents gave you a profession now you've got the profession now you ought to pay back you ought to reciprocate you ought to take care of your father take care of your mother in fact it says in verse 8 but if any provide not for his own you don't provide for your father your mother especially your mother now is uh, is a widow or your father is a widower it says if any provide not for his own especially for those of his own house of course if you're a father and you're still young and you're working and you're earning money you need to provide for your own children and for the whole family if you're a mother and you're working and you're well placed even better place than your husband you ought to make everything available it's not that this that one belongs to me i'm the one that worked for that it says if he provides not for his own he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel will provide for our own i didn't hear the amen 
And look at number five now. Number five, inseparable oneness. Inseparable oneness. That's a pillar. That's a pillar. Nothing ever happens that we're considering separation. Nothing ever happens we're considering divorce. Nothing ever happens we're considering I prefer to live alone. Nothing ever happens I stay by myself and you stay by yourself. A pillar in the family is inseparable oneness. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 13. But we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife shall be joined to his wife shall be joined to his wife and they two shall be one flesh inseparable oneness that's the will of God and that is the plan of God he wants the husband and the wife to be together to live together and to brace the storm together if there's any challenge around the family that's not the time to be thinking I think I need to leave this man to you know take care of all this and then you're having some reasons my husband I'm thinking I need to visit my mother I'm thinking I need to visit uh, my uncle I'm thinking I need to visit this and that what are you thinking of uh, going away with well, this uh, challenge? Two are better than one. Uh, if both of you are there, you can pray together. You can manifest faith together. You can uh, rub minds together and see how to solve the problem. But at the time when there's challenge, at the time when there's difficulty, that's the time I want to visit my uncle and I want to, you know, spend some uh, days outside. I think I need some time to have a prayer retreat at this particular time and leave the man to be hanging there all alone by himself is separable oneness we're looking at uh, Matthew Matthew chapter 19 Matthew chapter 19 I'm reading from verse 3 the Pharisees also came unto him tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read? Have ye not read? Have ye not read? Read your Bible. Read the word of God. There's a challenge in the, in the family, go back to the Bible. And there is temptation in the family, go back to the Bible. And there's trial in the family, go back to the Bible. Have ye not read that she which made them at the beginning, made them male and female? Male one, female one. And then it says, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife uh, that what cleave is like you, you know glue when you glue two things together to separate them you're going to destroy one or the other you cannot separate those things to have glued together an husband and wife man and woman by the marriage covenant you are glued together and it says uh, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh inseparable inseparable and then it goes on it says wherefore there are no more twain there are no more two but one flesh what therefore god has joined together let no man put asunder we're coming back to ephesians chapter 5 ephesians chapter 5 and i'm reading here from verse 32 and verse 33 number six mutual respect mutual respect we're looking at ephesians chapter 5 and i'm reading from verse 32 in verse 32 there is a great this is a great mystery but i speak concerning christ and the church nevertheless let every one of you in particular so love his wife as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband 
the wife see that she respect her husband the wife see that she honor her husband there must be that respect from the wife to the husband and let's look at the other side from the husband to the wife because this is mutual mutual respect we're looking at first peter chapter 3 first peter chapter 3 and i'm reading from verse 7 first peter chapter 3 verse 7 likewise ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge giving honor to the wife respect giving honor to the wife appreciation giving honor to the wife it works both ways as the husband respects the wife the wife respects the husband as the wife honors the husband the husband also honors the wife giving honor to the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as it has been years together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered i pray your prayers will not be hindered uh, number seven is submission number seven is submission we're coming back to ephesians chapter 5 Ephesians chapter 5, I read from verse 21. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. You see that? It's both ways, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Respect him, love him appreciate him honor him and in your mind in your heart don't despise him and then it will be easy for you to submit yourself unto your own husband as unto the lord for the husband is the hedge of the wife even as christ is the hedge of the church and he is the savior of the body therefore 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 as the church is subject unto christ so let the wives be to their own husbands tell me the rest tell me let me hear you i want to hear your voice in everything we're coming to genesis chapter 21 genesis chapter 21 i'm reading from verse 10 genesis chapter 21 we're reading from verse 10 genesis 21 reading from verse 10 in verse 10 it says wherefore she said unto abraham abraham cast out this bondwoman woman and her son and for the son of this bondwoman woman shall not be heir with my son even with isaac and the thing was very grievous in abraham's sight because of his son we have lunch, the wife ought to submit to the husband. And now we're looking at the other side. The wife has said something to the husband, Abraham. And Abraham felt, how could that be? I'm the head of the husband. I don't feel like that. I don't think like that. This should not be done. But look at this. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman in all that Sarah has said unto thee. In all that Sarah, your wife, has said unto thee, hacking unto her voice, hacking, obey, listen submit hacking unto our voice for in i seek shall thy seed be called and also of thy son of the son of the bond woman when i make a nation because he is thy seed and abram rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto hagar and putting it on her shoulder and the child and sent her away and she departed and wandered in the wilderness of beersheba you see the point that the submission is both ways there are times the wife would have a good idea and we are discussing about this about that and then you submit to her uh, kind of a suggestion or stipulation or what she's saying other times you have the good idea and then the wife is supposed to submit seven pillars in a godly family number one love 
Number two, self-sacrifice. Number three, righteousness. Number four, comprehensive care. Number five, inseparable oneness. Number six, mutual respect. Number seven, submission. Point number two now, the supportive partner for greater fruitfulness. The supportive partner for greater fruitfulness. We're coming to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, I read from verse 18. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. I will make him an help suitable for him. I will make him an help that is fit to the assignment I've given him. By the way, the Lord had given assignment to Adam. And he has said he should subdue the earth. He should have dominion over everything. And now alone, he can be fruitful, alone by himself. In fact, the Lord brought all the animals to him of whatever species, and Adam gave them name. And whatever name he gave those animals, that the name they bore, was a, he was a created complete. He was created already fruitful. He was created knowledgeable. He was created to know all things and to have all things. And yet God said, it's not right. It's not fit. And it's not suitable that the man should be alone. I will make a hell suitable for him that will help him, not that will slow him down, not that will destroy his plan, and not that it will, it will take away from what he ought to be and what he ought to do, it will give him greater fulfillment and greater fruitfulness and greater success. The reason why that Eve was created for Adam is so that Adam will succeed more, Adam will make more progress, Adam will have greater fruitfulness. That's the reason why the wife is giving to you. That even though you have been fruitful before, even though you have been a visionary before, now with the coming of the wife, she will be a support, supportive partner for greater fruitfulness. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm reading here from verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, reading from verse 9. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman was created for the man. The woman created for the man. The man already had a calling. The man already had a profession. The man already had the, co the covenant of the Lord. And now the woman was created to be a support. The woman for the man. For this cause ought, to, ought the woman to have power on her head. Because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman. Neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so the man also is by the woman. Uh, but all things are of God. We're coming to chapter 7. Chapter 7 of uh, First Corinthians. I'm reading from verse 2. Uh, First Corinthians chapter 7. We're reading here from verse 2. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. It's to support the husband so that the husband does not face temptation looking outside there, does not face uh, the devices of the enemy wanting to bring him down, wanting to use his flesh and wanting to use his desires to bring him down. And therefore, the wife is to support in that way, for the wife has not power over her own body in verse 4 eh, but the husband likewise also the husband has not power over his own body but the wife defraud not one another and they don't uh, cheat uh, one another it says defraud ye not one the other except it be by consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that satan tempt you not for your incontinency 
We're coming to chapter verse, uh, uh, look at verse 16 here. In verse 16, for what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Maybe your husband has some peculiar weaknesses, and now God has brought you into his life, and um, you are strong in this area, he's weak in this area. Do you know whether the Lord has brought you to that man so that you'll be uh, the one that will protect him so that he will not fall? Look at the second part of how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife. Look at verse 34. In verse 34, there is difference also between a wife and a virgin. Your married woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy in body and in spirit. The married woman uh, doesn't have any responsibility to a man, and therefore she can, you know, leave home and go and stay with her friend uh, for a few days over the weekend. After all, she's alone, and she can say, I want to go and do village evangelism and stay away there all through the time of her vacation from uh, the place of her capture all she not, she's all alone by herself she is so married look at the second part of that verse but she that is married careth for the things of the world she has to go to market things of the world she has to look for how to make up the home uh, that's the things of the world she has to look at how to take care of this and take care of that looking at those temporal things how she may please her husband band how she may please her husband uh, that's the supportive partner and uh, when the husband is pleased that way all distraction is gone all difficulties are taken out of the way and she's free free to jump and free to run and free to go here and there that's exactly why you came into his life and that's why you my you came into her life we're looking at genesis chapter 24 genesis chapter 24 and I'm reading from verse 67, Genesis chapter 60, chapter 24, reading from verse 67. And Isaac brought her into his mother uh, Sarah's tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Death. The mother was dead and something was missing in the heart, in the life, and in the psyche of, uh, of Isaac. But now, as the wife came, that, that was a good support, a good support, so that all the sorrow and all that she was, he was missing you know, in the departure of the mother, in the death of the mother, now the wife came to be the comfort. Judges chapter 13. In Judges chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 22. Judges chapter 13, verse 22. A man not said unto his wife, We shall surely die, because we have seen God. Here the husband was having uh, confusion and actually superstition. Here now we have seen God, and no, uh, there's no doubt we are going to die. My wife, you and I, we're going to die because we have seen God. But his wife said unto him, If the Lord were pleased to kill us, he would not have received a, a burnt offering and a meat offering at our hands. Neither would he have showed us all these things, nor would he, nor would as uh, at this time have told us such things as these. The wife now at age is fierce. That's what wives are for. When her husband is fearful of something, when, he's, when the husband is having some inhibitions and some difficulties and getting to a wrong conclusion, it happens sometimes like that. And the wife, in a cool manner, in a reasonable manner, will say, no, my husband, that cannot be. Let's have faith in God. If God were to destroy us, if God will not remember us, why will he show us this and show us this and show us this and then becomes a great uh, kind of uh, sustenance or stability for the husband. We're looking at Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27 and I'm reading from verse 19. The supportive partner 
for greater fruitfulness. In Matthew chapter 27, reading from verse 19, when he was set down on the judgment seat, this is talking about Pilate, he was to judge the Lord Jesus Christ, and he was set down. And all the crowds of the uh, Jewish people were pushing him, pushing him, pushing him. Do it now, do it now. And said the final thing, condemn him. He must die and he must be crucified. And now we're told in verse 19, his wife said unto him, saying, have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. The wife said to him, that's why you are there as a wife. Your husband is being pushed, is being goaded to take an action, an action that will destroy him, an action that will destroy the family, an action that will destroy his business, an action that will bring him under judgment unto the Almighty. And you are there, and you can see clearly, but the husband cannot see clearly. And you can see the bright vision of what will happen if your husband did the sin. And now that you have better knowledge and clear knowledge, you're saying to your husband, Husband, that's why you are there. You are a support to that husband. Look at uh, verse 24. In verse 24, when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and he washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person, see ye to it. And that's in line with what the, uh, what the wife had told him. Don't get involved in that scene. Don't put your hand there. And don't uh, sign that agreement because it's going to be something terrible. We're coming to Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 1. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 1. Every wise woman buildeth her house. Every wise woman buildeth her house. The house comprising of the husband and the wife, yourself, and the children. Every wise woman, wise wife buildeth her house. You're vigilant. You're looking at the steps your husband is taking. You're not saying, well, I'm not concerned about him. I don't have his knowledge. I don't have his vision. I don't have his uh, calling. I don't have this. I don't have that. Let him look at that to himself. I'll be praying for him. If he makes a mistake, that's unfortunate. And if he goes the right direction, good luck to him. No, you are part of his life. And you are part of his profession. And you are part of his calling. And you are part of his dream. And you are part of his proposals. And it says every wise woman builds her house. I pray you'll be a builder. Somebody there said, I pray you'll be a builder. I'll be a builder. I said, I will be a builder. I'm wondering why the workers are always, you know, they're detached from me and they're not going to respond every time. I want them to respond. Hey, let this be a family, God's family. And then let the pillars be in the family, in the church of God. Let there be love in the family, self-sacrifice in the family. And get out of yourself and say, I'm going to respond properly. Let there be righteousness. Let there be comprehensive care as your pastor is caring for you. Your father is caring for you. You're also caring for your father. Let there be inseparable oneness. Let there be mutual respect. He loves you. You love him. He honors you. You honor him. He respects you. You respect him. He wants to lift you up. You want to lift him up. He wants to encourage you. You want to encourage him. Let there be submission. Submission. And as we do, the Lord will bless us in Jesus' name. Look at Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31 is supportive partner uh, that is helping the husband, helping the family to get to greater, greater, greater heights and greater fruitfulness. We're looking at uh, Proverbs chapter 31. And I'm reading from verse 10. It says, You can find a virtuous woman, a virtuous wife, for a 
prize is above rubies. The heart of her husband does simply trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. That is, uh, wherever the husband is, wherever the wife is, there is uh, such a good understanding between the husband and the wife that the heart of the husband simply trusts in her. And it says in verse 12, she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She will not pull him down. She'll not tear him apart. She'll not discourage him. She'll not make him lose confidence in what he can do and the journey he can take and the work he can accomplish. She will not do that, but she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh work and flax and walketh willingly with her hands. If the opportunity is there for the woman to walk, she doesn't say, well, I'm not the husband, I'm not the breadwinner. She must look for work. It's the husband, it's the breadwinner. All the opportunities I have that I will work and bring money to the home, I will not do that. I will not do his work for him. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. If the line has fallen on your side, you walk willingly with your hands. She's like the merchant says she. That she bringeth her food from afar. If you have to provide for the family, at this time now, when the husband does not have the wherewithal to provide for the family, yes, she will. She rises also while it is yet night and give it meat to her household, a portion to her maidens. She considereth the field, she's enterprising, and buys it, and with the fruit of her hands, she planted a vineyard. Uh, why? Why is that? Uh, we don't have this in the family. We don't have this in the family. I was waiting for you. You are the man. You are the breadwinner. I bought all that money you have. I'm a woman. I'm your wife. You don't want your wife to be feeding you. You don't want your wife to be taking care of you. Do you? Of course I want. If I don't have and you have, what you have belongs to us together. What I have belongs to us together. Look at verse 17. She gathered her loins with strength and strengthened her arms. She perceives that her merchandise is good. Her candle goes not out by night. She has enough oil, she has enough ointment, and the light is burning every time, and the light will not go out in the night. She lays her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretches out her hand to the poor. She is giving to the poor. Yea, she reaches forth her hands to the needy. And if the old man is needy, she reaches children are needy she reaches out and the neighbors are needy she reaches out any one of them in their extended families they are needy and she reaches out that's her support and that's what god expects from that christian woman and that christian wife in verse 21 she's not afraid of the snow for her household for all her household are closed was scarlet she makes herself coverings of tapestry her clothing is silk and purple her husband is known in the gates they respect the husband at the gate because of the quality of wife he has and because of the character of the wife he has when he seated among the elders of the land she maketh fine linen and selleth each and delivereth the girdles unto the merchant as strength and honor are her clothing she's not uh, just into fashion she's into strength and she's into honor she will not do anything disgraceful anything disrespectful anything that is said uh, that will not bring honor to the husband and of course the husband to, to the wife he will not do anything that will bring disrespect and dishonor or disgrace unto the wife she shall rejoice in time to come he opens a mouth with wisdom she doesn't dig a grave for the family with her tongue she doesn't dig a a grave uh, for the husband with her tongue. She doesn't dig a grave for the children with her tongue. Before she speaks, she's going to sing. 
before she says anything she's going to say i will just go down with my husband i will this rob on my children she opens her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue is the law of kindness she looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness her children arise up and call her blessed and her husband also he praises her many daughters are done virtuously but thou excellest them all a favor is deceitful and beauty is fame you know sometimes uh, you get old as a woman that uh, beauty is not the number one thing people see is a character it's a behavior it's a stunning quality of your upbringing but a woman that fears the lord he shall be praised give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates that's a Christian woman, that's a godly woman, that's a converted woman, that's a gracious woman, that is a supportive partner to her husband, to her household, and to everyone around her, the supportive partner for greater fruitfulness. I come to point number three now, the specific preservatives for a glorious future. The specific preservatives for a glorious future. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16. I'm reading from the start here, one. Acts, chapter 16. Reading from the start here, one. In the start here, one. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Salvation is very important for the husband, for the wife, for the children, for every member of the family. And they speak unto him the word of the Lord and to all that are in his house. Everyone in the family, they responded to the word of God. When the word of God was to be shared in the family, Family, by Paul and Silas, the wife did not say, uh, I just remember, I need to go out now. Uh, my husband, please explain to Paul, that's why I cannot stay. And the children will dodge hearing the word of God. I cannot hear now, Daddy, please excuse me. But no, it says, they speak unto him the word of the Lord and to all that uh, in his house and he took them at the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized and all his straightway all his they believed he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved he that believeth not shall be damned and when he had brought them into his house he set meat before them and both husband and wife, they wanted to take care of Paul and Silas. They wanted to be hospitable. They have been converted. They have been saved. And because of his conversion and salvation, they wanted to take care of Paul and Silas now as the apostles of God, as leaders in the church of God no more, as prisoners. And it says, they set me before them and rejoice, believing in God with all his house believing in god with all his house that's what gives us a glorious future we're looking at luke chapter one luke chapter one i read from verses five and six the specific preservatives for a glorious future luke chapter one verse six there was in the days of herod the king of Judea, and the certain priest named Zacharias of the of the cause of Abiah, and his wife were of the daughters of Aaron, and his name was Elizabeth. Look at this, verse six now, and they were both righteous before God, and they were both righteous before God, old yet righteous not having children yet righteous and they, they were still serving the lord they were both righteous before god walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the lord 
blameless. Can you, will you notice something about this? A family, husband filled with the spirit, wife filled with the spirit, child filled with the spirit. Look at verse 13. Look at the child. And the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife, Elizabeth, shall bear thee a son. And thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness. And many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. And shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. I shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. He shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. The child filled with the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 41. Verse 41. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe lived in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Elizabeth, uh, the child, John, filled with the Holy Ghost, and the mother filled with the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 67. And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Can you see that? The father, the mother, and the only child, all of them filled with the Holy Ghost. That's what God wants for the whole family. That the old family, each one is born again. The old family, each one is sanctified. The whole family, each one is filled with the Holy Ghost. But then because you know that the salvation of the mother is not, in, is not enough for the father. And the salvation of the husband is not enough for the wife. And the salvation of the parents, not enough for the children. The salvation of the children, not enough for the parents. Each one must be saved. Each one must be sanctified. Each one must be filled with the Holy Ghost for a glorious future. Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 20. Ezekiel chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 20. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The soul in the singular. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. The father must be righteous by himself, and the mother must be righteous by himself, and the children must be righteous, each of them by themselves. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. We're looking at Ezekiel chapter 14. Ezekiel chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 16. Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 16. Though these three men were in each, as I live, says the Lord God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters, they only shall be delivered, but the land shall be desolate. They shall not deliver neither a son nor daughter. Look at verse 18. Those, these three men were in each, as I live, says the Lord God. They shall deliver neither daughter, nor neither sons nor daughters, but they only shall be delivered themselves. Look at verse 20. In verse 20, don't Noah and Daniel and Job were in each. As I live, says the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, but they shall deliver their own souls by their righteousness. Righteousness is not something transferable. I put that in the account of my child, is not born again, I'm born again. Put that in the account of my husband, I'm born again, but my husband is not born again, and therefore I give my salvation to her, to him. You cannot do that. Salvation is personal. Conversion is personal. And righteousness is personal. Getting to heaven is personal. It tells us in Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 12. Romans chapter 14, 
We're reading from verse 12. Romans chapter 14, verse 12. So then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Am I sanctified? Yes, that's mine. Am I filled with the Holy Ghost? That's mine. Am I doing the works of God? That's mine. You must do your own. I must do your own because every one of us shall give account of himself to God. How is it that the salvation of the husband doesn't pass uh, to the wife and the salvation of the wife doesn't pass uh, to the husband when we get over in the yonder? Uh, look at uh, Luke chapter 18. I'm reading Luke chapter 20. I'm reading from verse 34. Luke chapter 20. And we're reading from verse 34. Luke chapter 20. Reading from verse 34, and Jesus answering said unto them, The children of this world do marry and are given in marriage, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. Marriage is for this world and all the fellowship. And all the pillars of the marriage, they're good, they're supportive in this world. But each one in the family must have real spiritual life in the sight of the Lord. And it says in the resurrection, neither can they die anymore, for they are equal unto the angels of God. The angels that don't marry, when we get on the other side, we shall be like the angels and, and, and the children of God being the children of the resurrection. Each one then must have the gracious qualification to get to heaven. And I pray that none of us will miss heaven in Jesus' name. My wife is sanctified, so that's enough for our family, not enough. My husband is righteous, that's enough for the family, that's not enough. Everyone will give account of himself unto God. We're looking at Psalm 24, verse 3. Psalm 24, I'm reading from verse 3. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands, not they, not they, it's not plural, it's singular. He, the individual that has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. I pray that everything it takes for you to get to heaven, you'll possess in Jesus' name. Look at Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 6. Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 15. Revelation chapter 20, reading from verse 15. And whosoever, a man, a woman, a child, and whosoever, the husband of his saved wife, or the wife of a sanctified husband, and whosoever, the child of a holiness preacher, or the parent of a holiness child, it says, whosoever was not found reaching in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You will not be there. Revelation chapter 22, verse 12. Revelation 22, I'm reading from verse 12, and behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give to every man, every man, every man, to give to every man as his work shall be. The glorious future is for us individually, depending on if we're saved individually, depending on if we're sanctified individually, depending on if we're faithful to the Lord individually. I pray the Lord will find you faithful. The Lord will find me faithful. The Lord will find me faithful. You will in Jesus' name. 
what do we do now? Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. Suit yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. Is the heart hardened? Is the habit uh, see, a kind of congealed and hardened? It says, break up your fallow ground and reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. He will rain righteousness upon us. Rain righteousness upon us in the big journey and upon us and our families and let's remember our families and let us pray that all that god expects to be in our family the love the self-sacrifice the righteousness and the comprehensive care and his preparable one oneness and mutual respect and the submission will be in our families in jesus name the grace of god will multiply in our families the love of God will increase in our family. And the progress he has ordained for every one of us, progress will make it will be faster in each of our families in Jesus' name. The Lord answer your prayers. The Lord fulfill your petition. And the Lord give you the good desires of your heart for yourself individually, for your family, and for the family of God in Jesus' name. May this year be the best of the years you have ever lived since you were married in the mighty name of Jesus. The Lord pour that blessing upon you. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. Let the blessings multiply as the prayers go up unto the Lord. The Lord will fulfill His plan, His purpose of progress for every family and make our families godly and gracious and glorious in Jesus' name.